Good morning, welcome back. I want to start with an apology. Um, the <clears throat> Don't you want to hear my apology? They're rare. Um, the deadline we gave for the decision tree assignment was wrong. It was miscommunication. I never meant for it to be on Tuesday. It has to be on Sunday because I want you to have a chance to practice um, the next piece of material which is <clears throat> the um, linear regression and um, I usually give just six and a half days for an assignment and it's more than enough. Um, however, in this particular case because uh, we have a midterm coming up next Thursday, I strongly, strongly encourage you to start really early because I want you, uh, the next assignment, the, the, decision, uh, the, the uh, regression uh, assignment will be out um, actually very soon. Uh, it won't be due for another week afterwards, so it won't be due until after the midterm. But I want you, if you want, to get practice in this material, I want you to be able to look at the questions, solve them, submit them. Um, so um, start decision tree early, and I will make the current, uh, <clears throat> the next assignment uh, we will put it out maybe even as early as today. So <clears throat> you can attempt some of it with what we will discuss today. Um, and maybe half of it or so, I'll, I'll tell you roughly how much. And then the rest of it, uh, we'll have to wait until next Monday. Okay? Um, so <clears throat> a few more things about decision trees. Decision trees are very useful, um, or we call them decision trees, but we mostly do classification with them. We can also do regression with them. They're very useful because they're very general. You can throw them at just about any problem. There are a few modifications that we didn't discuss. For example, what happens if some of the covariates are continuous? Um, you still need to ask a discrete question about a continuous variable. So you could ask, is it greater than a certain value or less than or equal a certain value? Uh, which value should you choose? It depends on the data. We didn't have time to discuss it, but it's discussed in Tom Mitchell's book. I encourage you to look at that. Um, there are other considerations you could bring to bear in construction, constructing a decision tree. Um, so far, we discussed agreeing with the training data and minimizing the size of the, three, of the tree. But you can throw in another consideration. For example, you can decide that some covariates are easier to consult than others. Some attributes are easier, to, um, easier or cheaper or faster to look at than others. For example, if you are a doctor uh, and you're trying to diagnose a disease and there are 100 possible tests you could do um, and you have training examples from the values of all these tests and the uh, ultimate label, whether a person had the disease or not. If you build a standard decision tree, uh, you try to keep it as small as possible, the decision tree may choose a test that's very expensive or that's very invasive. So it may have a cost in money or in, in health or in consequences. So you may want to bias your tree towards attributes that um, are easier to test, maybe a clinical exam without having to send anything to the lab. All of these can be thrown into your optimization function. So we talked about the optimization function uh, being a sum of two components, the degree of fit to the data and the degree of simplicity. Well, you can throw in a third component, any component you want. And how you weigh them against one another is up to you how important it is to you to avoid expensive tests. Decision trees have one, one big um, weakness, and that is that they're very sensitive to their data. They make discrete decisions, what attributes to put in different places. Um, and those decisions are fairly robust at the root of the tree, when there's a lot of data to consider, but as the tree grows, as you go deeper and deeper in the tree, these decisions are made on smaller and smaller amounts of data. And at some point, invariably, these decisions are made on 
questionable evidence. That might be the point at which you stop growing the tree, as evidenced by performance on test data. But it's also the point at which the specifics of your sample can make a difference to what kind of tree you get. So if you get a sample from a distribution and you build a tree one day, you come back another day, you get another sample, different sample of the same size from the same distribution, and you build a different tree, chances are the trees would look somewhat different. You come back a third day, you get another sample, the same size from the same distribution, but a different sample, the tree would look different still. So this is true for all algorithms, but it's particularly strong for decision trees. And this property of getting a different outcome based on the randomness or the luck uh, of the sample is called variance. And it's very strongly related to the notion of variance we'll talk about today. So a variance of an algorithm or a variance of a machine learning method is the property of being sensitive to the peculiarities of the training data. Now you could imagine that if you restrict yourself to a tree that has a single node and you have a large sample, there will not be much variance because even though you get different samples on different days, the first question of which attribute has the highest mutual information with the label will probably be answered the same in all of them or almost all of them. So a tree with a single node typically does not have a large variance. But of course, we want trees that are more discriminative, that are better, uh, and invariably they will have large variance. So one big problem with decision trees, they have high variance. I want to mention two techniques that have been used to try to counter that. One of them is to say, if every sample gives me a somewhat different tree, let's turn this curse into a blessing. Let's turn this bug into a feature. Let's build many decision trees from many different samples and then average them, average their performance, average their decision. What do we mean by average their decision? If they're making a classification decision, then you consult all of them, you get the class from each one of them, and then you take a majority vote. If you use them for regression, it's even easier. You just average the numerical answer you get from all of them. So that's if you, could, if you had many, many samples uh, and they all gave you different trees. But in practice, we have one sample. What do we do? We sample from that sample. We resample. So we call that, this is our available training data. And we sample elements from the training data um, large enough to train a decision tree. We train the tree, we put it aside. We sample again from the same set. This method, the way of sampling from a sample uh, and looking at the properties of the different samples is called bootstrapping. Um, it's usually done with the replacement. So each sample point is sampled from the same distribution, which is the empirical distribution of the training data. Call it bootstrap. It's sampling with replacement from the data. You sample some amount of data, you train a tree, you keep sampling a different, um, a different sample, typically same amount, you build another tree, you build 100 trees, and now your overall result is the average of that tree or the majority vote of that tree. <laughs> By averaging over the many different kinds of trees you can get, we are reducing the variance of the outcome. So the outcome is far less sensitive to the specifics of the training data than if we had used a single tree. So this is called, this is called bagging. This, this process is called bagging, and what it does is variance reduction. We had somebody with a question here before. We still have the question. 
what's bagging and what's bootstrapping? Bootstrapping is the process of sampling from an existing data set multiple times. It is used for a variety of things. Bagging is the specific procedure that uses bootstrapping to create samples, train different trees on them, and average the trees. Bootstrapping is much more general. It's been around longer. It's been studied in great depth. Is this the same as cross-validation? This is not the same as cross-validation. Cross-validation is when you leave some of the data out to be used as test data. Okay? We don't, in the procedure I described now, we don't leave any data out. Well, you sample from the training data, so there may be some points that have not been sampled, and there may be some that have been sampled more than once. But it's not the same thing. So this is one method of fighting variance, too much variance in decision trees. Yeah? Uh, how much do you usually sample from the training data for the each time? So the first time when the begging paper came out in the 80s, the sampling uh, was 68% uh, of the training data. Uh, I think, but I think there was a different formulation. It was optimized uh, based on sampling without replacement, I think. I'm not sure. These days, I think you sample as, as much as the entire tree. I am not familiar with the theory that tells you how big it should be. There will obviously be a um, trade-off again. Um, one thing to notice here is that the result, the function you get at the end, what you learned, which is an average of trees, is not necessarily a tree in itself. When you take average of many members of a population, the rule that you get may not itself be necessarily expressible as a member of that population. So <clears throat> trees overall have no hard bias, so anything can be expressed as a tree, but if we restrict ourselves to trees of, say, 100 nodes, and let's say we do bagging, we keep building many, many trees of 100 nodes, or up to 100 nodes, and let's say we have 1,000 of them. Now we average their uh, decisions or their regression, the function that we get by this averaging may very well not be expressible as a tree of 100 nodes. So in a sense, we increase the expressive power of our method, which, as I mentioned last time, is not necessarily a good thing. More expressive power, even though it sounds good, is not necessarily good. But we went outside the expressive power of any single tree. Let me mention one other method that's used for variance reduction. It's very similar in spirit, uh, but it's a little different. Um, here we sample the training data. What if you sample the attributes instead of the training data or in addition to the training data? Suppose you have 100 attributes and you have a fixed amount of training data. Chances are there will be a few attributes that will be chosen that convey most of the mutual information with the label. You get another sample from the same distribution, you run the same algorithm, and you get a different tree, but it tends to use more of the same attributes. The majority of them would be the same. And another tree, and another tree, and another tree, what you will get is that some attributes keep featuring in almost all of them. And some attributes do not have a chance to provide their value because they're eclipsed by uh, the more informative attributes. If you wanted to do some more diversity into your collection of trees, um, you can decide that I'm going to now consider only 70 of these 100 attributes. I'm going to throw away 30 temporarily and try to build a tree or at least to split a node based on only 70 that you chose randomly. You can make this random choice at the level of a whole tree, or you can make it at the level of individual nodes. So you build the first node, um, and you allow it only 70 of the 100, of the 100 attributes. And then you come to this node, and you also allow it only 70, but a different subset, a different random selection of 70. So you can make this decision of which attributes to allow in many different ways. The important thing is that you are deliberately making your tree less good than it could be in some sense. Well, it's very much like the push for diversity these days in universities. It may be in the short term 
considering diversity may be reduced to some objective function, but in the long term it increases the diversity of viewpoints, the diversity of opinions, diversity of ideas. Same thing here, by deliberately boosting the chances of other attributes to show up, you're creating trees that have different ways of going about giving you the answer. And that in the long term will increase your accuracy. This method of um, building many trees that differ by which kind of attributes they are given and then averaging the result is called a random forest. Now why would they call this a forest and not this? This is also a forest. Whenever you have many trees, you have a forest, right? Um, it's just historical precedence. This is every much a forest as this is. But when people say random forest, they mean playing around with the attributes that are allowed. When they say bagging, they mean playing around with the amount of data being used. Yeah? Um, when you were talking about how you average the trees, you could get something that's not just from like, the population group. Mm -hmm. Is that just when you restrict it on the number of years? It's like everything can be random. The question is, when I say that the resulting average is not expressible as a tree by itself, is that true only in the case of restricting the number of training examples, as in bagging? I think not. I'm sorry? No, oh, I meant like, um, is, is it every function that we have to the tree? Oh, restricted number of nodes. Now I got you. Thank you. So the question is, when I say that the, when, when you use the, the trick of averaging many different variations of a rule, to create a new rule, that rule may not be expressible as the other rules. In the case of trees, we will see it in other cases too, but in the case of trees, I created many, many trees, I apply each one of them, I look at the result, and I average or do a majority vote, and I told you that that method, the whole method of averaging the result, is not necessarily expressible as a tree, and the question is, is it the case only because you restricted the number of nodes in that tree? Because otherwise, every function is expressible as a tree? And the answer is yes, you're correct. If I did not restrict the number of nodes, then because every function is expressible as a tree, then... Uh -huh. um, so it, it reduces the bias that you had before, and it might reduce it to zero, that maybe that anything is express, expressible, I don't know. Sometimes we don't know how to characterize the bias. Okay, so the take-home message is trees are very good, very easy to use, um, but suffer from too much variance relative to other methods and the standard way of dealing with that variance is by averaging variations, either variation on the amount of data they're trained on, that's called bagging, or variations on the attributes being used, that's called the random forest, uh, or random decision forest. Um, on the positive side, if you have a problem that you know is suitable for decision trees, what does that mean? We discussed it last time, you know that uh, it has, it, you believe that the answer depends on a relatively small number of covariates, but you don't know which. You have a lot of covariates, so you don't know which of them. Um, then decision trees are a very good way of, um, of discovering a good answer, a good explanation, and they have another nice benefit, and that is that the final tree, not if you use a forest, but if you use a single tree, is very easy to explain to people. Explain to yourself how it works, and explain to other people how it works. And that makes a big difference, uh, especially if you're trying to convince people who are experts in their field to use or to benefit from uh, machine learning. It's really important to, um, it really helps to be transparent and to be understandable, explainable. So if you have a, you're trying to convince a doctor to use a diagnostic uh, rule, if the diagnostic rule is expressed as a tree, that's something they can relate to. And in fact, many diagnostic rules in traditional medicine books are expressed as kind of as trees. Now, if you have this condition and this condition, but you don't have that condition, then it's probably this and so forth. Question? You said that a more expressive power does not necessarily make into a good thing. Right, but here, in this case, when we average things out, it is not clear why it, it would be a bad thing. Right. It's, uh, in this case, with averaging, the expressive power grows, 
Um, it's not necessarily good, it's not necessarily bad, it's, a, it's an outcome of the fact that we are now averaging many things. <laughs> we're not doing it because we wanted to change the expressive power, we're doing it because we wanted to reduce the variance. We wanted to reduce the sensitivity, the oversensitivity to the specifics of the sample. Yeah, it's a, it's a byproduct, side effect. Question? Uh, I have a question about the, the way to pick the, um, the 70 attributes from mm -hmm. So are we um, randomly picking 70 attributes when we are trying to decide um, the, the exact attribute we want to use on every node? Um, the question is, do you when you choose the subset of attributes that you are considering, do you do that randomly for every node? And uh, it depends on you. Uh, but yeah, the standard random uh, forest method chooses uh, separately on each, on each node, uh, a subset on each node. Um, you can also restrict it at, uh, at the level of a whole tree. Choose a subset for the tree and build a tree with that. I, uh, I, I'm not, uh, there is a lot of literature on the variations. I don't know it very well. Okay, let's move on. We're going to move on to something that you should know already. Um, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. And this is the basics of probability and um, linear, uh, a little bit of linear algebra, mostly linear, linear regression. Um, the reason I like to do it at this point is because I want to uh, contrast it with what we learned about information theory. Um, if you remember, my favorite angle to look at machine learning is through information theory. So the idea that there is a Y, and the Y has some uncertainty. And our job is to use all the access in the world to reduce the uncertainty in Y. Okay? That's how I like to look at that game. Well, you can also do that to some extent through um, st standard conventional statistics. And when you do it that way, it's called analysis of variance or reduction of variance. So variance plays the role analogous to the role of entropy. Now, they're very, very different. And I'm going to try to compare the differences between them, but also the similarities between them. Okay, so everything we do now, I will try to stop and point to analogies with, uh, with information theory. Things like um, mutual information and conditional entropy are all going to have their analogs here. We'll start by reminding you what a random variable is. A regular variable is something that holds a value. At any one time, it holds one fixed value. Very important, the value could be numerical or it could be something else. The value could be string, it could be a house, it could be a tree, it could be anything. So regular variables like x, y, and z, small letters, x could be negative 3.5, but y could be hi mom. And z could be some, z could be the color red or the color purple. A random variable, this is a variable. A random variable, which we will write with big letters, x, y, and z, do not hold a single value. They hold a set of values with corresponding probabilities. Regular va variable holds a single value. A random variable holds a set of values with probabilities attached to all of them. Okay? So an example would be the random variable x can hold the value 3 with probability 0 0.7 and negative 2.5 with probability 0 0.3. This is the value of x right now. Just like this x can change value, you can assign it a different value, you can assign a different value to this too, but the point is at any one time it holds a distribution. Distribution can be over a finite set, could be over an infinite set, and if it's infinite, it could be countable or not countable. It could be over the integers, it could be over the reals. Okay? Uh, another example, y can hold 2 and a third with probability 0 0.1 and high pop with 0 0.9. The point is the values don't even have to be of the same type. Or maybe this would be 0 
and here it would have the, all the color purple, 0.1. So any combination is fine. An important uh, thing about random variables is that functions of random variables are random variables themselves. Any function of a random variable is a random variable. Also an RV. Uh, this makes the most sense when the functions are numeric, so when the values of the random variables are numeric, but they don't have to be. You can define a function on things that are not numeric. But let's stick to the cases of numeric functions. If I take this x and I define a new random variable um, z to be x squared, what is the distribution of x squared? What values does it take? And with both probabilities? Well, this would be 9 with the same probability, 0 0.7, and mm, 6.25, I believe, with probability 0 0.3. Sometimes I will not bother giving it a letter. I will just say x squared. Since x is uppercase, you know that it's a random variable, and x squared is a function of x, it's also a random variable. I can do x squared plus 1. This is big X, x squared plus 1. What is the distribution of x squared plus 1? It's 10 with probability 0 0.7 and 7.25 with probability 0 0.3. So as we apply numerical operations to random variables, we are applying them to the values and we're preserving, for the most part, the values here. Sometimes, these don't get preserved. For example, if x takes on values negative 2 and positive 2 with some probabilities, p and uh, make it concrete, 0 0.6, 0 0.4. What is the distribution of x squared? It takes on only one value, 4, with probability 1.0. That's still a random variable. It's also a regular variable because it's a de degenerate distribution, but it's a random variable. So every regular variable is a special case of a random variable. So sometimes when you apply these operations, you merge some, some values. All right, a little bit of a review of probability theory. Um, when we write this uh, probability of little x, what we really mean is that there's an underlying random variable, typically we would call it big X, and this is the probability of the random variable taking on the value little x. So this is shorthand for probability of the event that big X has the value little x. <coughs> Similarly for, um, by the way, all of this I typed neatly in uh, notes. It's online, so you don't need to write it down. Um, unless you feel it helps you, um, but it's all available. Joint probability is shorthand for the event that big X is little x and big Y is little y. And the same for conditional probability of Y condition on X. It's defined as probability of X and Y divided by probability of X, and then you put in the definitions. Um, let me uh, remind you what it means for two random variables to be independent. X is independent of Y. Independence. What this means, by definition, is for any value of X, that big X can take, and for every value of Y that big Y can take, P of X comma Y is equals to P of X times P of Y. Or in words, we say that the joint is equal to the product of the marginals. Why are these called marginals? Because we can express them as a sum 
of the joint summed over the y. So if we put it in a table, it would be written in the margin. It would be the right column or the bottom, like we did uh, with our example of mutual information. This is the definition of independence. Um, Independence is symmetric, so if x is independent of y, y is independent of x, you can see it in the definition. Um, expectation. Expectation, or also mean of a random variable. I write it as e of x. Notice the difference, I, I try to uh, always use uppercase for random variable and lowercase for regular variables. Um, this is simply defined as the weighted sum of the value of x weighted by the probability of that value, or the probability that big X takes this value. And this is over all values of x that are allowed by the random variable. If it's a continuous random variable, it will be a integral or um, we use the term expectation, we use the term mean. I prefer the term expectation because the word mean uh, is sometimes used to mean average, and average is over a set of um, well, it could be any set, it could be over this set, but also is used as sample mean, a sample average. So to make it clear that there's a very big difference between sample mean and expectation, I use expectation for expectation and sample average or sample mean um, for, for a sample. Sample mean is a statistical quantity, or it's actually it's called the statistics. Expectation is a theoretical quantity. It's a, it's, a fun, it's a function of the random variable. It's a function of the distribution. The most important thing to uh, remember about expectations is that they're linear. Uh, what does that mean? It means it's fairly easy to uh, work with them. You can apply expectation to a complicated thing like ax plus by plus c. What is this? This is a random variable because it's a function of two random variables. a, b, and c are small letters, they're constants. x and y are random variables. This is a function of a random variable and we said it a function of a random variable, I think I wrote it somewhere. Any function of a random variable is itself a random variable. So this whole thing together is a random variable. If it's a random variable, we can talk about its expectation. Doesn't mean all random variables have expectations, but most of them do. This expectation is very easy to calculate by, we say we push the E sign or the expectation operator inside the function. So this becomes A times the expectation of X plus B times the expectation of y plus c. That's what it means for something to be linear. A linear function means that you can separate additions and pull out constants, multiplicative constants. What if the function uh, here is not linear? What about expectation of some function of x? How would you compare it to the function of the expectation of x? Can you put an uh, equality sign here? You did here. This is the function f, but not here. If it's a um, nonlinear function, then you may not do that. So what can you say? 
Well, in the general case, you can't say much. But if the function is convex, that implies a particular direction of, um, of the inequality. And if it's concave, it implies the opposite direction. So uh, let's take an example of the function f, b, f of x being x squared. If f of x is x squared, we're comparing e of x squared to e of x squared, which we will sometimes write with the two here, e squared of x. But what it means is e of x squared. Uh, in this particular case, we know that the relationship is like this. And in fact, most of the time, the equality sign will not hold. It will only hold in the generate case. When, when the distribution is degenerate, there's only one value. Let's look at the, um, or this function. Well, the way I drew it, it's uh, the origin, so it's right. The way I wrote it, it's here. The first derivative here is negative. And here is positive. The second derivative is positive everywhere. This is an example of a, now you have to correct me, I always get the, the uh, words wrong. I think this is a concave function. Is that right? Whereas the opposite of it is convex. Is the opposite? Yeah, I always get it wrong. Thank you. I get the math right. I get the notation wrong. I do it every year. Thank you for <laughs> being here. So this is convex. And the opposite would be concave. Um, this, I'm not going to prove it, but I'm just going to state it as a famous rule called Jensen's, Jensen's inequality. Jensen's inequality says that for any convex function, you can relate e of f of x to f of v of x. Now, if you insist that um, x squared is convex, then um, this is e of f of x, so you relate it this way. When in doubt, Always look at the example of x squared. When the second derivative is always positive, this is the direction of the inequality. When the second derivative is always negative, it's the opposite direction of the inequality. This inequality is very useful in calculation of uh, expectations and probabilities. Let's talk about the variance of a random variable. Var of x or v of x. First of all, it's defined as take the random variable, center it in some sense by subtracting its mean. What is this? What kind of a f this is a random variable, right? Why is it a random variable? Because this is a random variable, and we're subtracting from it something which is actually a constant. So here's another rule. When you apply an expectation to a random variable, 
you usually turn it into a constant. If it's a single random variable and you take the expectation over that random variable, what you have in your hand is no longer a random variable, it's a constant. So this is a constant, but this is a random variable. And a random variable minus a constant is a random variable. Okay. So this whole thing is a random variable. I'm going to take the square of it, that's again a random variable, right? And I'm going to take the expectation of this thing, and the expectation of a random variable is no longer a random variable. It's a constant. So the variance is another operator that takes a random variable and produces a constant. Constant with regard to that random variable. It may not be a constant with regard to something else. Now we can take this formula and write it more generally and call it the second moment second moment of x with regard to point A. The second moment of x with regard to point A is taking x, subtracting A from it, taking the square, and taking the expectation of that. And you can generalize that to any moment. So the first moment would be without the square, the third moment would be with the cube, and so forth. So variance can be seen as a second moment with regard to the mean, also known as the central second moment. One thing that's very useful to uh, notice is that as you vary A, if you keep X constant and you vary A, you change the point around which you do the second moment, you get the minimum value when A is the mean of the population. So the variance is the minimum possible value of this when you minimize over A. So if you look at the sum of squared differences, uh, the smallest value you'll get is when it's the differences from the mean. Um, another formula that is often used with variance that's very, very convenient to remember is the variance of x is the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. This is exactly the formula we used there as an example. And if you remember from the formula here, this is guaranteed to be larger or equal this, and it's almost always larger. It's only equal when it's a degenerate distribution, which means this is guaranteed to be greater or equal zero, and it's only equal if it's a gen degenerate distribution, namely there's a single value. X has a single value with probability 100%. Any other case, this is a strict inequality. Variance is greater than zero. Um, next, I'll define standard deviation, which we write as this sigma of x, and it's simply defined as the square root of the variance of x. Usually positive square root. Now let's define covariance. The covariance of two random variables, x and y. Uh, first, we write it like this, as sigma of x and y. And this is no coincidence. We will see later the relationship between um, covariance and standard deviation. Um, is defined as, 
you take one of the random variables and you, cent and you center it by subtracting its mean. And then you do the same thing with the second one, y minus e of y, and you multiply them together. This is the definition of covariance. Now we can use the linearity of expectation to simplify or at least manipulate this expression. You can push the expectation inside here. So you can open these parentheses. This is x times y. This is x times expectation of y. This is expectation of x times y. Expectation of x times expectation of y. The thing to notice is that these are constants, but these are random variables. The reason it's important is that um, when you have uh, an expectation of something that's a constant times a random variable, that's very easy to deal with. You can take the constant out. When you have an expectation of the product of two random variables, you cannot separate them. Right? Expectation of x times y is not necessarily expectation of x times expectation of y. But expectation of constant times y is the constant times the expectation of y. Constants can be taken out, random variables cannot. So this would be expectation of xy minus expectation of, um, well, let me do it in, in uh, stages. xy minus x times e of y minus e of x times y minus e of x times e of y. This is entirely a constant. This is a constant times a random variable. This is a constant times a random variable. And this is two random variables. I'm sorry? A plus. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I will continue it here. Just so we finish it here. We have e of x times y. And here we have expectation of x times e of y. This becomes expectation of x. We take this out, and we have expectation of x. So we have minus e of x, e of y minus e of x, e of y, or e of y, e of x, plus e of x, e of y. They all look the same. So we have minus something, minus something, plus something. So we cross this out and this out. And we're left with this. The covariance between two random variables can be thought of or expressed as the expectation of the product minus the product of the expectation. Can this be negative? Yes, it can be negative. So covariance can be negative. I don't know where we write it. If I know that the covariance is 0, I can conclude that it actually goes both way, that e of x times y is equal to v of x times z e of y. Now, look at the definition of standard deviation. It's a square root of the variance. The variance can be written as e of x squared minus e squared of x. 
we wrote it over there. This should look familiar to you. It looks like this. So now we see that variance is a special case of covariance. So, variance of x can be thought of as covariance between x and x. So we could have started with just the definition of covariance and derived everything else from it. Let's look at properties of variance. What is the variance of, I'll just write V. What is the variance of uh, X plus constant B? What is the expectation of X plus B? Can you simplify this? Yeah, this is just the expectation of X plus B. What about this? Variance is a measure of spread. Mean or expectation is a measure of location, central tendency, where you're where kind of the center of the action is. Variance is a measure of how things are spread around the center. So if that center is shifted, the variance doesn't change. So variance is invariant with regard to additive constants. This is just variance of x. What about variance of A times X? Because variance is a squared measure, this A gets squared on its way out. If you look at the formula, you'll convince yourself this is equal to A squared times variance of X. Whereas here, E of AX is A times E of X. What about variance of X plus Y? In the case of expectation, we said it's very simple, it's linear. Expectation of X plus Y is expectation of X plus expectation of Y. Not so with variance, almost. So with variance, it is the variance of x plus the variance of y plus, I'm sorry, minus, no plus, two covariance between x and y. Very useful formula, which means that if the covariance between x and y is zero, Variance is additive. Or in general, the variance, the, the way to remember that, the way I remember it, is the variance of independent random variables is additive. The variance of independent events is additive. This reminds me somewhat of the Pythagorean theorem. Why Pythagorean theorem? In the Pythagorean theorem, you have orthogonal dimensions, which is, in my mind, the analogous to independent. And you're saying that the square in one dimension and the square in the other dimension add up. And it's true not just for a triangle, but it's true in high dimensions. The Pythagorean theorem holds in any dimension the sum of the squares of all independent, of all orthogonal axes equals the square of the hypotenuse in that high dimension. So for example, in a cube, you have width, uh, length square plus width square plus height square gives you the square of the uh, main diagonal. So um, this kind of reminds me of that if, if they were independent. And that's true not just for two, it's true for any number. So now we can apply variance to more complicated things like AX plus BY plus C. 
the plus C goes away right away. Then we apply this formula. And finally, we get the A and B out at the cost of squaring them. So this becomes A squared times variance of X plus B squared times variance of Y plus A times B times the covariance, I'm sorry, 2 AB times the covariance of X and Y. From this, we can generalize to any set of uh, random variables the variance of a weighted sum wi xi. So wi are now constants, and xi's are now random variables. i goes to n. Can be written as sum ij of um, wi w times wj times the covariance of xi and xj. Where are these parts? The answer is we're, we are um, treating variance of any xi as a covariance between xi and itself. I. Sorry? I, I equals? Sorry? What is I equal to? Well, I and J both go from 1 to N. So this is summation uh, over all possible pairs. And you may wonder where this 2 is. And the answer is every I and J are present both I and J and J and I. So the easiest way to see it is to think of it as here's the vector of x1 through xn. Here's the vector of x1 through xn again. And here is what we call the covariance matrix. The covariance matrix, well, we will have here not just these vectors, we will have here the weights too, w1, wn, w1, wn. And here we will have in position ij, we will have covariance xi, xj. This is a symmetric matrix. It's symmetric around the diagonal. In the diagonal, we have the self-covariances, also known as variances. Question? Uh, I think in this part, you left out a piece, because we're talking about just the variance of x and the variance of y. Is the covariance, is this the whole thing? That is the whole thing, and uh, I, I made that point, but maybe not clearly enough. So the variance of x in is in, in the diagonal. Okay. No, that's, it's a good point. You noticed it, and uh, we often write this in vector notation. So this would be W X um, T <coughs> covariance matrix, uh, which is usually written as sigma. Sigma not to mean summation; it's just notation. It's covariance matrix. And here you have W, um, X again. This is N by one. This is, uh, I'm sorry, one by N. So it, uh, I wrote it the wrong way, right? Yeah. This should be one by N. And this should be N by one because the result should be one by one. So this is one by n, and this is n by one. One by n, n by n, n by one, the result is one by one number. In the special case, when the variables are uncorrelated or independent, Um, this matrix is a diagonal matrix. You have all the covariances are zero, except for the diagonal. For all, for all ij, x, 
if, I'll write here, if for all i j, x i, x j are uncorrelated, what you get is just a summation based on the diagonal, and that can be written as some um, single sum, i goes from 1 to n, of w i squared variance of x i. So this goes back to the observation uh, or the rule I mentioned earlier that is very useful. When variables are uncorrelated, their variance is additive. Just add it up. If you have weights, then you have to square the weights, but otherwise they add up. All right, let's talk about um, <coughs> standard error, sigma of AX, sigma lives in the same space as expectation. Expectation is linear, if the random variable measures grams, then expectations is in grams. Variance is squared. If the random variable measures seconds, variance is second squared. Sigma is the square root of that, so it's back in the units of the original random variable. So variance could be second square, sigma would be seconds again. Which is not, therefore not surprising that the way to get a constant out is by just taking it out, but making sure it's positive. And sigma of ax plus b, you can simply ignore the b because sigma is based on the variance, and variance is shift invariant. So this would still be times sigma of x. The last thing I want you to know that is quite useful is if you take covariance of AX plus B with CY plus D. So this is a covariance of two random variables, but the, each one of them has been multiplied by some amount and shifted by some amount. After you use all the properties that we showed, well, you can do it in two steps. First of all, you know that covariance is shift invariant because of this, so you can get rid of the B and D. So this is the same as covariance of AX with, B, uh, with CY. And then you can take out the A and the C, A times C times covariance of X and Y. All of this is in the notes. You don't need to copy it. You may be better off just thinking about what it means. I want to show you what I think is the neatest result or theorem or law here. It's called the law of total variance. And it's very strongly uh, relevant to machine learning. I forgot to mention analogies to information theory. Variance of a random variable is somewhat analogous to entropy. Let me write that here. Um, I want to emphasize both that they are similar, but also that they are different. I'm not sure how to do that. I'll write here variance of x is kind of similar, but kind of not exactly quite different than entropy of x. In fact, let me use y because we're going to dwell on y. Entropy of y and variance of y. So let me first digress and talk about differences and similarities. One big difference 
what, what, one big similarity is they both measure your uncertainty about it. They both measure, they both acknowledge the fact that it's not a constant, it has multiple values, and it try, they try to kind of measure how similar or different the values are, or how, much, how far off you'll be if you guess, okay? That would be a way of measuring it. But um, big difference is variance is only meaningful for numerical random variables or more generally for random variables where you can define a distance measure between values. For practical purposes, it means numerical. Because for the definition of variance, you need to subtract the values of random variables from something, from like the expectation, and square, you have to take mathematical operations. If you look at the definition of entropy, it does not require anything of the values of the random variable. If you look at the definition of entropy, it's a sum over all values of y of p of y times log 1 over p of y. Nowhere in this formula do we actually compute anything with y. We iterate over it, but we don't use y. We use the probability of y, not y. So y itself could have values like London, France, New York, right? We can still calculate entropy. Whereas if y has values like London, France, and New York, we cannot calculate variance. It's not defined. What is London min minus Paris? You know, we don't know. If you look at the definition of variance, it definitely uses um, I'll write it as similar to this as possible, summation over the values of y, uh, p of y times y minus e of y squared. Here we use y, and here we use y again. So one point for information theory. Information theory helps you deal with quantities that are not necessarily numerical. They don't have to live in a Cartesian space. You only care about the, their distribution, not about their values. All right, let's go back to the law of total variance. We, our target is to learn why to reduce its uncertainty or its spread as much as possible. Law of total variance obviously applies when there is variance, namely for numerical random variables. In a numerical random variable, you could still measure entropy, but you could choose to measure the spread as the thing that you want to reduce. I want to reduce the variance by relying on some covariates. Let's say for simplicity now, one covariate, x. So I'm going to condition one y on x. y conditioned on x. What does that mean? This is a little bit like our conditional entropy of y conditioned on x. A little bit like. First let me write the equation e of x, y and then v of that. Plus the opposite, E on the outside, of V on the inside. So this is our formula and we will, I will try to parse it now for you. It's a very nice symmetric formula. We care about Y and we care about explaining it with X. So you have Y condition on X, Y condition on X. And it tells us that the overall variance in y, the unadulterated, unchanged, just y, can be thought of for any x as composing of two parts. The variance of the expectation of y given x and the expectation of the variance of y given x. E and v and v of e. Still confusing, so let me first, let me further uh, annotate it. Whenever you see multiple random variables and you see symbols like expectation and variance, you should always ask yourself, 
what are the expectations or variance over? Which random variable are they over? Usually we don't need to indicate it because it's clear there's only one random variable. If I say E of X, clearly it's expectation over X. If I say V of Y, it's variance over Y. But here we have two random variables. So we need to uh, be careful and we need to annotate them. Um, so when you have an expression like this, usually the, the, the meaning is that this is the random variable you care about. So this is an expectation over Y. Which means, what is this now? What is it a function of? It's a function of which random variable? It's a function of x. By taking the expectation with regard to y, we marginalized over y, we got y out of the picture, it remains a function of x. Okay? That means for different small values of x, it would have different values. And you can also think about it as a random variable because x has a distribution. So with some probability, it would take on some value corresponding to one particular x. With a different probability, it will take on a different value corresponding to a different value of x. It's a function of x. It's a random variable. And therefore, we can take its variance. So this is a variance with regard to x. This is a very similar story, but the v and the e are changed. The variance is with regard to the main random variable here, not the conditioning event. So it's variance of y. This becomes a function of x only. It's a random variable because it's a function of x. And therefore, we can take the expectation with regard to x. So that's the first part of explaining what this is. Now comes the more intuition part of explaining what this is. What we did here is basically break down the uncertainty or the spread in y or the variance of y into the part that's explained by x and the part that remains unexplained. In very strong analogy with information theory where we have the part that's explained by x is the mutual information and the part that remains is the conditional entropy of y condition on knowing x. Except information theory, we deal with information and uncertainty. Here we deal with spread or variance. This is the explained variance. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to argue for you why this is the explained variance. Part of, part of variance of y explained by x. Um, part of that remains, I just said that remains, or that remains unexplained so far. The best way to see it is with clustering. I'll give you several examples, but the best way to see it is first with clustering. Suppose you have a bunch of data points. Now, X and Y are not going to mean the usual horizontal and vertical. That's not X and Y. What Y is is the location of each point. What X is is which cluster it belongs to. Y is a distribution over points. X is clusters. Suppose I somehow through some algorithmic method decided this is a cluster, this is a cluster, and this is a cluster. And I calculate for each one of them their mean. This is the mean of this cluster or the weighted average, well, mean. This is the mean of this cluster. I can now express 
the overall spread of the data points in terms of the spread of the data point around each mean and then the spread of the means. So let's parse this out. Which one should we start with? Let me start with this one. What is this part here? This is the variance in Y, in the data points, conditioned on being in a cluster. Let's say for a particular X, that means a particular cluster, there's a certain variance of these points around this mean. The variance means the sum of squared distances. I do that for one X, I do it for another X, I do it for a third X. And I take the average of the expectation over the axis. This is not a straight average, this is a weighted average. If I have many more points here, it would count more. This is why it's an expectation, not a simple averaging. What is this part? This is the expectation of y condition in a particular cluster. What does that mean? It's the center of the cluster. It's the mean of the cluster. It's where I put those big X's, big uh, crosses. And now I look at their variance across all clusters. That gives me the variance of the centers of, this, of these, which means I only see three points in this case. I see this point, this point, and this point. Their mean is here. Their squared distance are these. And I can calculate the, um, the variance of that. So the law of total variance in the case of clustering means that the variance of a point can be expressed, uh, the variance of all the points, the variance of the set, can be expressed as a sum, can be decomposed as a sum, of the within cluster variance and the cross cluster variance. This is the within cluster variance. This thing becomes within cluster variance. Uh, it's the average within cluster variance because you could have some clusters with a lot of variance, some clusters with little variance, and you you average them proportionately to how many points they have. And this is the cross-cluster variance. It's the variance between how far the clusters are from each other. And this gives us a way of choosing what a good cluster is. A good cluster, a good clustering, is a clustering that minimizes the within-cluster variance and maximizes the cross-cluster variance. We know that the sum has to be fixed. It's fixed by the data points we have. We want a clustering that explains as much of the variance as possible by which cluster you belong to. So this gives us a direct uh, optimization formula for choosing between alternative clusterings. Uh, when we come back, uh, we will talk about a different uh, reinterpretation of this law in the context of, uh, say, linear regression. Um, I want to remind you that the homework will be out hopefully today. They will overlap the, the decision tree homework, but this is just to give you an extra, you, you'll have more than a week. You'll have way after, you'll have until next Sunday, the following Sunday, way after the exam. I just want you to have an opportunity to look at the questions, make sure you understand them, uh, try them out, come to office hours. We will hold office hours. One set of TAs will hold office hours for decision trees. The other set of TAs will hold office hours for uh, this new material. Okay? Thank you.